Hello, everyone, and welcome to Esoterica's The Interview. Uh, today, I am very excited and thrilled, and I think thrilled is the right term to use, to have uh, Dr. Michael Arntfield on the show. Uh, Dr. Arntfield is a global expert and a former detective who's devoted his career to solving cold cases and um, now has a new book uh, called How to Solve a Cold Case and Everything Else You Wanted to Know About Catching a Killer. Uh, welcome, Michael. Thanks for having me on. Oh, thank you for thank you for your time. Um, I mean, cold cases is kind of a term that has penetrated the um, I guess penetrated the popular culture. I mean, what is a cold? What is a cold case? Is it really a term that's used in, in the industry? Well, like I mentioned in the book, it has no actual forensic or legal standing or, or, or definition. It's really a, a media coinage. Um, okay. Going back to A and E's cold case files, is you might say um, the progenitor to what's now true crime. Um, but there is an accepted definition among most investigators and certainly homicide scholars um, that basically there's three criteria. Uh, so the actual term for a cold case would be unresolved homicide. So what you have is an unresolved homicide uh, where there's not been any substantive action. The investigative log uh, has not been updated in at least 12 months. There are no outstanding um pieces of evidence that you're waiting on. So no lab report, no DNA report, uh, no video, uh, you know, that you're expected to be formatted and sent to you. And the original investigator is no longer attached to the case. They've transferred mm -hmm. out, they've retired, they've died. So you can see based on, if you have those three things going on, that really a case could be cold after a year. I mean, right. you hear a lot of police departments say, you know, no case is ever cold. And yes, this is 48 years old, but it's still not a cold case. Well, it is. It is when the, when the last time someone was interviewed. When's the last time you know uh, you re you retested an exhibit from that maybe could yield DNA based on current adequacy standards? So, um, yeah, I mean, when you've got those three, it's cold, whether you'd like it or not. Right now, you, in your book, you talk about which I thought was fascinating um, about, and I guess this also ties into the fascination with um, with serial killers, with cold cases. I mean, I don't think you can really turn on the television or turn on whatever streaming service you have without coming across some fictional account of a serial killer or cold case. But you talk about this public responsibility and, uh, and about this bill that your nonprofit put forward that uh, wants to assign cold cases or have other agencies pick up cold cases. Can you talk about that a little bit? So the group to which I belong, the Murder Accountability Project, this is a registered not-for-profit uh, homicide think tank based in Washington, D.C., or um, sort of D.C. metro area. Uh, and uh, we had proposed, I uh, received bipartisan um, endorsement from members of both the GOP and the, the Democratic Party under the previous president uh, to put forward um, a Homicide Victims Families Rights Act mm -hmm. that basically would allow um, not just cold cases, but I mean, unfortunately, well, most, again, police investigators are very uh, committed, very conscientious, but there are cases out there that have just been bungled. There's mm -hmm. no other way to describe them. And in those circumstances, the family, uh, who, I mean, I can tell you many cases are re-victimized through this process, mm -hmm. uh, would have the option of... Um, of requiring that police agency with jurisdiction to at least open up the file and share uh, the file with another agency. Well, now, whether that's another law enforcement agency, whether that's a group like the Murder Accountability Project or my Cold Case Society or the VDOC Society, which is based in Philadelphia, mm -hmm. uh, which I mentioned in the book, um, and, and we, who are brought in on a voluntary basis by law enforcement sometimes, this act would compel agencies to do stuff like that if mm -hmm. you know, 10 20 years goes by and nobody's even paying attention anymore what's the harm right i mean do you th can you see a scenario in which that leads to crowdsourcing of crimes well we have to be careful as to you know it, it, this isn't just putting it out into the public sphere for for commentary this would be either be a, a, a we proposed a, a list of vetting criteria in terms of um 
what age, what types of agencies could get access to these files. So it, it's not just sort of like a, a book club. You right. would have you would have to go through uh, like any government vendor uh, mm -hmm. approval pre approval process. Right. I mean, that's, it's fascinating, and I, I'm sure that would help. Now, what percentage of crimes? Because I, I mean, as a as a consumer of you know fictional media of crimes, uh, what percentage of actual crimes or don't get solved? Because I mean, I, we're under the assumption, I think, with you know, with being inundated in the media, that they all do kind of get solved eventually, uh, and that you know, there's the kind of stereotype of the DNA being left at the crime scene, and someone's going to eventually make a mistake, and a very smart uh, investigator will figure it out. But that's is that true in any way? Not really. So yeah. we have to differentiate between crime and and murders. So crime right. generally. Um, it depends on the category of crime, but it's it's widely accepted among criminologists that two thirds of of all crimes don't even get reported and are invisible to police. Mm -hmm. So we're talking, you know, seventy percent of residential burglaries get solved. Well, that's seventy percent of the only thirty three percent that are reported. So right. um, murder. Uh, as I explained in the book, you would think that it would be tough to make a murder invisible to the police or statisticians, but it happens. There's a there's a, a, an epidemic of what we call concealed or missing homicides, misclassified, right. miscoded, whatever. Um, of the homicides that we know exist that are reported to police uh, since around 2016, and in fact, it, it bottomed out in 2020, just a mm -hmm. little over half get solved. So you're looking at one and two killers never identified by police at the by the time they have to report this occurrence to the Justice Department. Right. So, so that's that's not good. Some agencies are obviously better. You're looking at like an 80 percent, 85 percent solve rate. Some are, are far worse. Right. Uh, and they drag down the, the the national average as a result. Right. Now, that's that's very um, that's enough to keep anyone awake at night. Um, there's a term you use in the book, which uh, I'm not, I don't know if you coined it or it's been, it's common a common term, but it really I found it quite heart wrenching, and it was uh, the missing missing. Right. Um, can you tell me what that means? Well, this is in part. Uh, so I didn't coin that. This is yeah. uh, I'm not sure who did, but it's been out here for some time. Um, I talk about concealed homicides or, or, or crimes that. Um, murders that don't end up properly coded or investigated. The missing missing are going to be a number, represent a number of those. These are people who are missing, mm -hmm. but there is no record of their being missing. So they're, uh, that no one misses them. So they are technically, they've been removed typically against their will from whatever world they, they lived in. But that world is so on the margins mm -hmm. that, there's no job that they don't show up to that someone takes notice. There's no family member or friends checking in on them to take notice. Um, often we only know these people are missing because, um, believe it or not, some kind of uh, their absence causes some kind of annoyance for a neighbor. So um, you'll see if they're in an apartment, for instance, flyers are piling up in the hallway. Right. All the landlord, the landlord knocks on the door, goes and sees, you know, food expired or, or that they haven't been there in months. And by then they're they're often already dead, and um, so these are people who um, often we don't know what happened to them until they're found, and mm -hmm. the remains. And again, a number of those remains remain unidentified. And there's an RCMP section uh, devoted entirely to that. There's thousands of unidentified remains. Uh, actually, there's a chilling story that you recount in your book um, of a of a gentleman who had just recently left jail. And was mentioning that his yeah. his his mother and sister had stopped visiting him and couldn't couldn't find any evidence what happened to him. I mean, is it? I mean, I guess it, it's sad, but is that common that two people, a mother and daughter? I mean, there would be no records of them. No one, no one reported the missing. Yeah, no one knows about that case, and this is right. a, the the value I think that the book will impart is that I mean, a lot of these cases are ones I've investigated firsthand, never publicly, uh, you know, talked about before or, and ones like this one uh, where, yeah, you have a high school age female and her mother who's employed full time in a suburban house um, with a group of friends, a doctor, a dentist, a boss, classmate, mm -hmm. teachers, and um, are murdered. 
and nobody notices their disappearance. And it was, so if it can happen to them, imagine what the person with mental health issues and addiction issues who has unstable housing and no job. I mean, an organized predator, um, I mean, could go trolling for those people and and remain undiscovered as again, people like uh, Picton did uh, for Mm -hmm. many years. I mean, there, there's there is this assumption um, that you know about the missing missing. You know that they are if if it's true, as I'm sure you you are correct, that they live on the margin of society. It, uh, from a public's perspective, perspective, there seems to be this assumption that the police aren't as eager to look for them if they are on the streets or in in Canada. Of course, there's you know horrendous uh, cases of. Aboriginal women that just disappear. Um, I mean, how how accurate is it? Are, do some cases get more attention than others? Well, um, there is, I try to avoid absolutes whenever sure. explaining this stuff. And this is also going on in the US where, you know, there's, a, there's an epidemic of, you know, racial intolerance or, or you know, um, whatever, indifference to the plights of certain people. In some cases, yes, but uh, a lot of this can be chalked up to just incompetence. Right. Uh, a lot of investigators in these cities or areas where they are subjected to contract policing by the RCMP or the OPP um, in Ontario, mm-hmm. Quebec, um, they don't have a lot of experience. Mm-hmm. Uh, these people going missing they don't necessarily, there's not necessarily a lot of leads. They often don't have formal bank accounts so that you could check, for instance, with a production order uh, to see if they're accessing those accounts so you could get an idea if they're still alive. Mm -hmm. Uh, So there aren't those levers that you can apply as you could in the case of, uh, for instance, the the, the mother and daughter, where um, there's a record of the sale of the house that they can follow. House was sold. Her signature been forged. They can follow that paper trail. They can follow digital uh, trail. Okay, so let's identify their phones. Uh, are their phones still pinging off any towers? No. So the phones have gone dark. Um, these are all steps that, that that can be taken. Whereas somebody who um, ends is on the margins is on the margins because they don't have the types of um, resources uh, that. Um, allow their lives to be sort of dug through uh, mm-hmm. for, for leads. And in other cases, again, it is just indifference or, or um, but often those involve agencies uh, or the types of cops who are indifferent to everything. So it's, right. it's not that they've got uh, an animus towards a specific group or gender. Uh, mm-hmm. It's that they, they just don't want to do real work. And right. fortunately that, that's not as, um, you know, provocative a title to suggest that there's some conspiracy, uh, but in reality, it's a conspiracy of one, and it's called laziness and incompetence. Right. Yeah. Ouch. I I imagine that that plays a big part. Um, now, you you mentioned the U.S. versus Canada. I mean, there is this perception of Canada being a safe haven, and we don't have the kind of you know we don't have the gun violence, we don't have murder rates of the, that they do in the United States. I mean, that's. I mean, you're talking about how that's not accurate, but it, can you elaborate on that? Yeah, I mean, there's parts of, of uh, Canada, mostly smaller communities that have um, violent crime rates per 100,000 uh, and other types of crime uh, that, that mirror U.S. cities that are uh, notoriously, supposedly crime-ridden. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the Canadian rate of, of solving um, serious crimes is on par with, with the U.S. And in fact, mm-hmm in many cases, far worse than, than, again, U.S. cities that sort of get tarred with being, you know, unduly dangerous. And right. we do have statistically fewer over nationally, right. uh, fewer murders, but the still a stagnant solved rate. So we're solving fewer of, uh, fewer of those fewer cases. So that's not, right. I would suggest, something to boast about. Right. Uh, what, is, there, is there a town in Canada known as, like, the most dangerous place? I don't want to advertise it, but uh, <laughs> I mean, so one of my other, I mean, they're uh, in the West, in the prairies, uh, mm-hmm. but then you get weird anomalies, like in my book, Murder City, where I identify right. the fact that London, Ontario, which is where the university I, I right. teach, 
uh, was a per capita um, headquarter for serial killers for 30 years. Right. Uh, and no one knows why. I, I float a few hypotheses as to why that maybe was allowed to happen or, or the, the circumstances right. that uh, collided at the time to allow that to happen. But um, I mean, whether it's London or whether it's, uh, you know, Winnipeg, um, it's, um, it comes down to resources, mm -hmm. comes down to, to resources and that um, whether it's human resources, technical resources, uh, it just, crime is, is, is not given, uh, is not made the priority that you would think it is in, in a lot of places. Mm -hmm. and, I mentioned this when I in some interviews about the Nova Scotia massacre, the Port of Peak massacre. Right. Uh, in that uh, a lot of, especially with everybody moving out of cities and there's, there's a lot of sort of itinerancy among Canadians right now. Mm -hmm. Something nobody thinks about when they look at schools, they look at property taxes, they look at, uh, mm -hmm. you know, is there are whole foods. If you live <laughs> in a, in a community where there's contract policing. Yeah. Um, and we see this in the inquiry. Uh, where you have, th you're talking about threadbare police mm -hmm. departments run out of detachments uh, that m are typically, uh, you know, at skeleton crew staffing. And when you have a major incident, like in Porto Peak, you have three cops going scene to scene, uh, you know, worried about being sniped at. There's a house on fire here. There's an active shooter here. It, it, it just, hmm. well, you will not get emergency police service, period. And this is not something that people, I think, are aware of or think about how those contract uh, frontline police services are provided in most of the country. Mm -hmm. So you've got, I mean, a, a handful of cities that um, have, you know, well-trained uh, and, um, you know, uh, well-staffed police departments of experienced officers. And then you, again, you've got this patchwork where a lot of people are kind of on their own. Yeah, it's, it's, it's frightening. Actually, I, I mean, obviously I saw the, the London Ontario um, connection and, um, and I, as I went to Western, I mean, it's many years ago, but, um, you know, it's something I would, I would have never expected in, in an idyllic looking town. Like, I mean, I, I suppose that's where the fiction comes in because it is, it looks like a, a serial killer town if you were to film a, 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 a film a movie about it. But uh, as a student, I certainly never thought about it um, as being a, a, a place for, you know, many crimes. Yeah. And I mean, the student experience as a Western has changed, but right. I'm assuming you went there probably in the nineties Yeah, uh, and I mean, a totally different city Yeah, and a totally different student experience where, I mean, this is where Western and a couple of other universities, ha universities have this reputation where basically you're, you're under the dome, basically you live right. sort of on campus and with in the, the sort of run of bars and student neighborhoods around mm -hmm. it. It's, it's, it's a simulated sort of, adult middle class experience but that is not the reality for for much of the city and especially right. in the city would be unrecognizable to you now if you came here yeah no it's i actually did i was not far from I, london actually over the summer and did a little drive around and i yeah it looks very different uh yes. the, from what i remember it um so um <laughs> Now, you mentioned that you mentioned one case and I know you're, you're not at liberty to speak about a lot of other cases, but, um, you know, it, it's interesting when you think about cases we don't know about and cases we do. Um, and I, I what comes to mind, obviously, being in Toronto is the case of the Shermans. And, uh, you know, I, I think about it because when you think about, you know, the fictional pr presentation of, you know, unsolved mysteries, it, it's hard to imagine it in, you know, a city like Toronto where there are cameras everywhere, where there are phones everywhere, where there are people everywhere, where there is, as you said, you know, the, an actual, you know, police force, um, I, you know, and, and such high profile. I mean, we're talking about billionaires. I mean, there aren't, there are billionaires in Canada, but there are, you know, handfuls of them. They aren't everywhere. How is it possible that we have no idea what happened? Um, well, I'll say the same thing I, I said to you before uh, we started. Kevin Donovan's book, The Billionaire Murders, is right. the definitive authority on this case. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not an authority on this case. I've right. some commentary generally. Uh, but 
in part the, the mystery stems from, and this is explored in his book, um, the host of, because it is so seemingly impossible, mm -hmm. um, that and, and given who we're dealing with, uh, that opens up a realm of possibilities as to motive uh, that really is a bottomless pit and right. have an uphill, I mean, are going to have to look at, uh, you know, dozens of groups of people Mm -hmm. uh, uh, who are persons of interest, not necessarily suspects, but who need to be vetted and spoken to mm -hmm. and eliminated as being potential suspects because um, they may have had historical access to the house. They may have had a financial motive to do this. Mm -hmm. They may have had a personal motive to do this. Mm -hmm. uh, you're looking at someone who is capable enough to stage the crime scene and uh, throw seasoned investigators off. Right. Um, so are we talking to someone who has seen a lot of stuff like this, uh, read up on a lot of, you know, crime scene staging, forensic countermeasures, or have they done this before? And then if yeah. that's the case, you've got a, a, another host of, of possibilities. Mm -hmm. So, um, or is the most logical explanation and simplest explanation the correct one? Right. Um, and this is um, what police are dealing with and what I think his book ex explores very well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it is it is fascinating, I guess. And that's why I suppose we're so fascinated by by true crime stories is um, that kind of mystery of it all. Um, I mean, do you think uh, has do you think the the rise of true crime has has it has it inspired more people to commit crimes? Is there a correlation between criminals and uh, the creativity part of it? So I talk about that in the book as well, the four waves of true crime as I've identified them, sort of four separate generations that were obsessed with, with crime and the products that came out of those generations. The medium obviously has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's gone from principally sort of chat books and, and some novels to uh, now podcasting as the dominant um, right. Yeah. Medium. And, and in fact, in my true crime class uh, at Western, the, the main project is not an essay. You have to create an investigative podcast or a podcast that serves an investigative purpose versus some of these salacious ones that just tell uh, stories. Mm -hmm. So I see it as actually because of that um, visceral engagement um, mm -hmm. and the fact that, you know, you, you have the, the accessibility to content. I see it as actually um, assisting with um, assisting cases, keeping uh, interest in cold cases alive, uh, having people learn more about the investigative process, about the criminal mind. Again, when they're done well, mm -hmm. uh, are they overtly inspiring uh, offenders? I think there's other things that are doing that. I mean, we know there's a perfect storm. 2020, not only the lowest solved rate for uh, homicide in recorded history mm -hmm. in the United States, also the single largest jump in homicide in decades. Mm -hmm. So um, and I explain this in the book. Um, I think um, the measures taken by certain governments during the pandemic um, and then f forces beyond most people's control have probably created a, a generation of, of offenders and deviants uh, far more than just, you know, watching uh, Netflix docu-series. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, can you elaborate why? I mean, is it the uh, mental health of, um, yeah, clients that, or clients, I mean, mental health of, of perpetrators that have just been pushed to their breaking point? That's one issue. Um, substances, increased substance use is another mm -hmm. issue. Obviously, uh, there's, there's some stats on, uh, or there's just sort of materializing now users who couldn't get their typical drug and are then started experimenting with far more dangerous, far more addictive substances. Mm -hmm. uh, that's more people now in the, in the game, so to speak, who are prepared to commit crimes to get drug money or prepared to rip people off or, or kill people. Mm -hmm. But most significantly, I talked about this at length in the book in Canada, some years ago, they um, put restrictions stemming from the Nelson Mandela inquiry. Basically um, they put restrictions on the types of offenders or on the length that offenders could be put into solitary confinement in prison. Right. Said that it was 15 days maximum. And these are already dangerous, in many cases, people to end up in a federal penitentiary and then to be penalized because of assaults on guards or assaults on uh, 
you know, other inmates. Mm -hmm. And even then the studies have shown that uh, after 15 days, the, uh, the specific deterrent of being there begins to ebb and the offender sort of uh, loses touch with reality, goes deeper into sort mm. of uh, revenge fantasy mode, loses touch with reality. And with each passing day thereafter becomes exponentially more dangerous once they're put back into the general population. Wow. So okay. 15 days, mm -hmm. how about 15 months imposed right. on higher population, most of whom have never done anything wrong and are now um, screwed up right. uh, or um, no longer incentivized to, to play by the rules because what did it get them? Two years right. of house rules. Why, why would you be incentivized to do anything? That's actually a frightening and I think very um, illuminating analogy. I think that's, wow, that will keep a lot of us awake at night for sure. Um Next yeah. to a couple, there's uh, two illegal CIA human experiments conducted in the 60s, okay. uh, Project Chaos and MK Ultra. Uh, next to those, mm -hmm. this is the most dangerous human experiment ever conducted, and we're, we're seeing the results of it now. Again, wow. uh, record-setting homicide rates, uh, record-setting overdose rates, divorce mm -hmm. rates, uh, incarceration rates, even with the courts being basically closed. Uh, and the lowest solved rate in recorded history, which goes back almost a full century. Yeah. Wow. Yikes. That's um, that does. So I guess this is this will play out over the next many years. I mean, this is not a short lived experiment, right? That's right. No. Yeah. The, the hangover of this is going to be huge. And I mentioned that in the book and that. Right. Now is the time for people to get invested again and in, in assisting with cold cases um, because do the math record number of murders record low solved rate, these are all going to be carried forward. Right. Start accumulating. And 10 years from now, I mean, who knows how many of these unsolved crimes, unsolved murders specifically, uh, it's going to be far more than the police are going to be able to tackle, which is why I advocate for, um, you know, everybody doing their part, including just submit your DNA to uh, uh, right. private uh, genealogy uh, or, if you have done the test, upload it to, to one of the open source websites uh, to maximize, as I mentioned in the book, you may be uh, remotely either descended from or related to a killer and not even know it. And you're doing that could help solve the cold case. Okay, so that's the fascinating. I'd love to end on that. I mean, what should the public do? I mean, we talk about how, you know, the public can get involved. Um, so, I mean, so take one of those my DNA tests and... What, I mean, what are some other suggestions you have? Um, well, that's the big one because yeah. I, I've mentioned this before. Uh, genomics, as it's officially called, yeah. it has been the biggest leap. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, DNA testing really sort of came online in 98, 99. The DNA Identification Act in Canada was 1998. The database sort of went live in 99. That was huge. Uh, but it was sort of slow to get going. You needed a ton of DNA. Each test, you know, used up a lot of it. So you had to be judicious about how much uh, or which ones you submitted for testing separate right. from, apart from the data bank that, that compares samples, you know, every 24 hours. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, I mean, there's an agency in Texas. I mentioned this in an op-ed that I wrote for the Globe and Mail a couple of weeks ago. They're solving like three cases a week whether it's a cold case homicide or whether it's an unidentified remains that now has a name 50, 60 years later, the rate at which this technology is changing and solving cases, really mm -hmm. anything with DNA is potentially now solvable and no matter how seemingly unsolvable. Interesting. Okay. So note to readers and listeners, uh, uh, upload your DNA. Um, do you have your DNA in, in dead databases? Do you do that personally as well? Yep. Yeah. So I did 23andMe, and then uh, you can upload that to to um, uh, open source sites. Um, mm -hmm. GD Match is the big one that basically uh, law enforcement. I mean, if they could, as I mentioned in the book, they could shut that down tomorrow, right. and still enough samples that have been captured by these labs and, and law enforcement that they've got at least enough to work with. Wow. And it's sort of complicated to explain, but it's, I think your average person thinks that somehow these companies are making matches between crime scenes and offenders. They, all they are are the middle people. Right. And, 
this is why the private sector is leading this because the, these experts just aren't in law enforcement naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, you're finding genetic markers common to certain bloodlines mm -hmm. and then the real investigation starts. So we know it's this uh, one of these three families who have, right. you know, um, we know it's a male, we can probably narrow down when in their lives this may have happened. So now you've got maybe 30, sus 30 people of interest. Mm -hmm. And then you go from there. And then the ultimate match is when you either um, dig them up, exhume them to get a sample if they're dead, uh, or um, keep them under surveillance until you can get a, a discarded sample of DNA and then compare it apples to apples to the original crime scene. So all this, is, is, all this does is significantly shrink uh, the haystack to look for the needle, but it doesn't give you the needle. So these people with hang-ups about, oh, yeah, I don't want this company, you know, you know, providing my information to law enforcement, well, or or coming after me. That's not how it works. Uh, it's right. not how it works. All it's doing is filling in the missing link that mm -hmm. these legacy DNA technologies like CODIS, the Combined DNA Index System, um, that they have. It rely the system has always relied on. Crime scene samples being matched to convicted offenders. But when you have an offender who never ends up in the system, right. nothing to compare it to. Well, now you've got an entire population to compare it to. Mm -hmm. and there's going to be a, 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 a connection to the bloodline somewhere that, that the police can follow. Right. Wow. Fascinating. Okay. Well, I think I'm going to try it now, now that you've convinced me. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Arnfield. This has been really um so illuminating and um and frightening all at the same time but more illuminating and i really appreciate your time thanks for having me on enjoy the rest of the book too i will thank you very much take care bye, -bye. bye everyone